praise Him. I love to praise His name. I love to praise Him. I love to praise His name. Oh, I love to praise His holy name. I love to praise Him. I love to praise His name. I love to put my hands together and praise Him. I love to praise His name. I love to praise. I love to praise His name. Oh, I love to praise His holy name. Holy name. That He's my rock. He's my rock. My rock. My rock. My rock. My sword is shield. Said He's my wheel. He's my wheel. In the middle, in the middle, of, middle of, the of the wind. I know He'll never, know never, 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 ever let me down. Let me down. He's just such a He's just a joy. Oh, oh, I love him. 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 I
Jesus. Oh, just say, I love you, Jesus. Oh, it's three very special words, three very words that have a lot of power. I love you, Jesus. It's for I love you, Jesus. I love Jesus. He loves me, hallelujah. I love Jesus. Let the world know that you love Jesus this morning. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Keep playing it softly. Keep playing it softly. Keep playing it. Keep playing it. Keep playing it softly. Keep playing it softly. Keep playing it softly. Ah. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, keep keep playing it softly. Somebody want to get that in your spirit. Come on, come on, come on more. Anybody loving more? Come on, come on. I'm just looking at some folk. I love you, Jesus. Come on, come on. I worship and adore you. Anybody besides me? Just one. Not because I'm asking you, but because he woke you up. Come on, you just came through. Come on, come on. Please just. Not because I'm asking you, but because he's worthy. Somebody say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. It's personal. It's personal. It's not because I, I worship him. Anybody? Just one. Come on, this might be your Lord, I love you more. In spite of yourself. Somebody say, I love you. Jesus. I love Jesus. Come on, in your mess, he still. I worship him. And you worship him in the midst of your mess. He kept you out of some bad things. Lord, I love, I love you more. more than anything. If you're able to stand, if you're able to stand, everybody on your feet. Oh, it may be cloudy outside, but not in my spirit. Oh, come on, come on. It all belongs to him. Anybody glad to be here today? And just, I feel just kind of half, I feel all right. Come on, I, I mean, I feel okay. I may not have everything I want, but, but I feel okay today. Oh, come on. Somebody couldn't make it. There's somebody in the hospital that... But God brought you. Is that, that enough just to give him some praise for? I love you more. I promise you, if you just think about it for one minute, of how good God is right now, at this moment in your life. I worship and adore you, Lord. I want to tell the Lord. Every head bow. Just keep playing it softly. Keep playing it softly. Keep playing it softly. We serve a more God. He can do more for us than anything or anybody else can do. He can provide us more than we can even begin to ask for. And 
really a matter of fact, we don't even know all of what to ask for. But he looks beyond everything and give us what we need. And that's more than we deserve. So I thank God for being a more God. That when I need love, he provides us more love. He provides us more mercy. Thank God he provides us more grace. And he looks beyond our faults and supplies more of our needs. And every now and then, God gives us some of what we want. So in this season of Thanksgiving, God, we lift your name in praise. For every day is a day of Thanksgiving. We know we calendar the day, the day that we celebrate with family, but 365 days of the year is a day of Thanksgiving. Every day you wake us up, God, we are thankful. Every moment that you allow us to have oxygen in our lungs, we want to tell you thank you. We can't beat your giving no matter how hard we try. So God, we say you thank you every day. And God, please forgive us if, if somebody in here woke up this morning and didn't tell you thank you. Forgive us, God, if we laid down last night and didn't tell you thank you. But God, we humble ourselves before you to thank you for being a more God who looks beyond our human fallacies and frailties. And you bless us anyhow. So God, thank you. Thank you for this atmosphere. I'm not interested in numbers, but making numbers count. So your people that are here today, God, we lift your name in praise. You do what you do in the atmosphere because it belongs to you anyway. Have mercy. We need you, Lord. Hear our prayer. So oh Lord, that peace. Us, oh Lord, thy peace. Master, we put every trust. We put our trust in thee. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the strength that we need. Supply every need. Supply our every need. Master, teach us your holy. Teach us your holy way. These are the words. The words. These are the words we pray. Teach us your holy way. Thank you, have mercy. These are the, the words, words we pray. if you don't mind. Amen. Our congregation of him is, oh, I want to see him, to look upon his face. Dad, the same. That's the right. As I journey through, as I journey through the land, and sing it. singing as I go, Pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many arrows pierce my soul from without within. But 
That it's so good to see you, Pastor. And it it's so good to see you all. Basketball season has started, amen. And you know I have other duties, uh, but I ain't going nowhere in December. And hopefully, if I get this flight changed, no place in January ever. So you got me, amen. And I ain't going, I'm going to do you justice, amen. I do thank Reverend Ron, do thank Reverend Ambersley for holding down the bloodstained banner in my absence, and I pray that you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving, amen. Uh, I know that many of our family members are traveling and on the road and sharing with their loved ones, but thank God you all don't have no family out of town, and that you're in the house of the Lord one more time, amen, amen. Let us look at what's going on now in the life history of our church and some of the activities that are going on at the Brooklyn Church. Again, you may follow us on social media, both on Twitter and on Facebook. Some of the activities that are going on also this week and also this month, Bible studies this Wednesday at 645. As we continue our study of the book of Proverbs, you will gain wisdom. Amen. Please join us Wednesday at 645. Ridgeview is having a canned goods drive. You'll see a box there for canned goods for Ridgeview. And the Women's Day Committee is doing a clothes drive that is also in the lobby. 
the angel tree gifts, angel tree gifts, first of all, give yourselves a hand for everybody has gotten an angel. And the gifts are due first Sunday, December the 2nd. Again, the gifts are due December 2nd. Again, wrapped neatly, not stapled. Amen? Amen. We do need volunteers for a benevolent choir to sing at funerals. Again, nothing more uh, is already dead enough, but you do want people here to bring some joy, amen, to a funeral. And so if you have time and have a flexible schedule, please see French and give her her name if you might be a part of our benevolent choir. Kaya, our last Kaya for this year, which has come as you are, our young adult Bible study, is Monday, December 3rd. And we're going to be talking about dealing with depression during the holidays, amen dealing with depression during the holidays. More people commit suicide in December than any other month. For many of us, it's a month of joy. We can't wait to Christmas. For some, it is the saddest month. So we want to talk about that again. And you don't, don't matter your age on this one. Come December the 3rd to our Kaya event. Our church budget meeting for the entire church, for the entire church for Brooklyn Worldwide is Monday, December the 10th on the west side. Again, the church budget meeting for the entire church is Monday the 10th. And then I will present after Bible study our Brooklyn Northeast budget on Wednesday, December the 12th. Amen. As the old mother would say, please govern yourselves accordingly. Amen. Amen. We certainly would like to recognize any visitors that might be with us this Sunday morning. If you're visiting the Brooklyn Church, especially if you're out of town with your family, here for Thanksgiving, you may stand or just raise your hand. We just want to thank God for you. God bless you, my sister. Thank you for standing and raising. God bless your family right there. God bless you right there. God bless your family, all of you all here who share in our baby dedication. Brooklyn, let us stand and welcome one another. Show the peace of God during our period of fellowship. Amen. <laughs> cut the air down. I know some of y'all having your little personal summers right now. A little personal summer right now. We just cut the air down for you to make you feel more comfortable. Amen? Amen. 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 You're welcome. In Jesus' name. We just want you to feel what hell might feel like so you don't want to go there. Amen. 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 All hearts and minds clear, we come to a very sacred part of our service, a very sacred part in the life history of our church. Uh, no matter how big we get, how grown we get, uh, this church will always call and give God glory and give God thanks when he brings life into our church. Amen. And I would like um, Rod and LaShonda to come forward. Rod and LaShonda Palmer, if you would come forward and face me with your baby girl, and I assume you pronounce it Ryan? Ryan, is that correct? You all face me with Ryan. I have a niece by the name of Ryan. 
so many different loving ways that you can spell it. And now she's special. Amen. Amen. Any grandparents, grandparents, stand where you are. If you're a grandparent, you stand where you are. Let's give God praise for the ancestors. Amen. Amen. Godparents, any godparents here among us? Y'all stand where you are. The godparents stand where you are. God bless your heart. My brother, I have seven. <laughs> seven. That's a lot of birthdays. It's a lot of Christmas gifts that I have to buy. That's 14 a year. I don't know how many you got, but you just got one. You, you do your job. You hear me? You do your job. You got three? You're a good man. Okay, I got you. All right. I ain't taking no more. All applications will go in file 13. Amen? Any aunts or uncles? Any aunts or uncles? Please stand where you are. Thank God for you bringing here and also the village. All of you who part of this Palmer family stand where you are to show your love and support. Let's give the village a Ryan a hand of praise. Amen. Rod and Lashana, we come today because God has brought us here today. We come today in honor of Hannah, who was barren for a while. And she made God a promise. And she said, God, if you bless me anyhow, I said, anyhow, whatever you bless me with, I promise you that I will give that blessing back to you. And when he did bless her, she did just as she promised God that she would return her baby boy and give him back to God and for his glory. Do you all believe that Ryan is a gift from God? Hallelujah. That's amen, my sister. Do you believe that God has chosen you as vessels to make sure that Ryan one day will grow up in the fear and admonition of the Lord? And you promise to not only tell Ryan how to act, tell Ryan what to believe, but you will show her through deed and example how to live a good Christian life. And you, the village, do you promise to babysit for free? <laughs> to buy birthday and Christmas gifts. To be there when they need her. To be that village that would also show Ryan the ways of the Lord. If that is your desire and your promise before God, say we will. Amen. Join hands with someone near you. Join hands with someone near you. Let us pray. God, our Father, we come today to bring Ryan back to you. For it's you, God, that allowed Ryan to grow in her mother's womb. It was you, God, who allowed some doctors and a few nurses to bring her into life, God. We thank you, God, that you gave us this blessing, God. And in the tradition of Hannah, we bring her back to you to say thank you, God. For we truly believe that you are the giver and sustainer of life. And you are the author and the finisher of our faith, God. And we believe that every good and perfect thing comes from you. And right now, this baby girl is good and perfect, God. And we pray, God, that you keep her this way. Let no hurt, no harm, no danger. Let no little sickness interfere with her growth and development, God. Even though she's going to get little colds, God, even though she might get the flu, God, even though little sicknesses might come to her little body, God, we pray, God, that you heal her right now in the name of Jesus, God. We put a hedge of protection around her, God, and make sure, God, that nothing takes her away from her God-given purpose. You sent her here to earth for a purpose, God, and we pray, God, that that purpose lives out. Bless now these parents. Bless the grandparents. Bless the Godfather. Bless the village that will help Ryan grow in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And as we lay our hands upon her head, we bless her right now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
let's give God praise. Amen. Give God praise. Amen. It's offering time now in the house of the Lord. It's offering time now in the house of the Lord. We thank you all for what you've given on behalf of the mission and the ministry of the Brooklyn Church. We thank you for those of you who are still sowing a seed into our building plans. Amen. Last week we received another $700 just for our building plan. And I thank you that you have not given up, God. Right there on your pledge envelope, you'll see a little line that says BNECF. And we pray that you put us something on that line where it says BNECF beyond your tithe and your offering so we can pay off this building and do what God has planned for us to do. Amen. Let us bow and thank God in advance for what he's about to do through our offertory period. God, our Father, again, we thank you right now as we just offered Ryan back unto you because we believe that she came from you, God. We now come to worship you through our tithes and our offering, God. It is worship time now because you're worthy to pour into you. You're worthy to see through God because we know, God, that when we pour into you, we get a blessing on the other side, God. Not because of the amount that we've given, but because of our obedience to you and your word. For your words say, just try you, God. Just try you, God. Just try you, God. And if we try you, God, we have to trust you, God, that you're going to make sure that the 90 that we're left with is even more than the hundred that we started off with, God. So thank you for your people who believe in the power of tithing, God. And then, God, we ask that someone be pricked today, somebody be convicted today, to pour into our capital fund so that we can build the building that you have promised to the Brooklyn Northeast people. It's in the mighty and master's name of Jesus our Christ we give, and all that believe would say amen. On behalf of Monitha and the children and I, keep playing Jacoby, we are so appreciative of not only the ministerial staff, but the church who supports the children so much. We're also appreciative of the parents who not only come and bring the children, but those who give a little extra. April Garrett is, Angel Garrett is one of those parents. She said very early on that she wanted to teach the children some songs. And she's done that. She's chosen songs for the children to sing. She comes in and teaches the children. And today, she is going to direct the Mississippi Mass Choir children, <laughs> their original version of Inside Out. And she did all of this while going through her own personal storm. Please welcome Angel.
Thank you, Benita. Thank you to our children. Thank you to our parents who bring your children out. Amen. They can't drive here on their own. Amen. They don't have no school bus to bring them to children's choir rehearsal. Amen. So we thank you for the sacrifice that you make to make sure that our children are here and singing and understand God. Amen. And so they have a joy of God's music. Amen. And I don't know if me singing at the Second Calvary Baptist Church or my dad doing that gospel program. That's all I listened to. I, my, my friends were amazed when I was at the University of North Carolina. That's all I listened to was gospel, amen. If you rode in my car, it wasn't no Tupac, it wasn't no Biggie, it was the Mississippi Mass Choir, amen. I wasn't changing for nobody, amen. Amen. Give God praise again if you don't mind. I might have told you before, and I don't mind admitting you don't want to admit stuff, um, but, I, but I, I troll on Facebook. <laughs> what that mean, Pastor? <laughs> I look, but I don't comment. <laughs> you know, everybody has an opinion. 
everybody got something else too, and some of them are one and the same, amen? And there are a whole lot of people who start a lot of controversies on Facebook. Some of them use it as their <laughs> bully pulpits and like to start stuff and ask controversial questions, and they get different opinions from everybody. And some of the stuff just that people report, even some facts just ain't true, amen? Sometimes I'll read what should be news on Facebook, but if it ain't on CNN or on USA Today, then it usually is, as Donald Trump would say, fake news, amen? But there, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, there was a debate um, that uh, came on Facebook that I have uh, personal attachment to and personal feelings about. Play that, play that for me, um, Damon. Here, here is the controversy that comes up um, during Thanksgiving weekend. The great debate is who eat chitlins. That is the great debate that went on this week. Who amongst us eats chitlins? And I want to let you know that your light-skinned, bougie, Christian Louis Vuitton-wearing pastor eats him some chitlins. Can I get another chitlin witness up in here? Can I get another chitlin witness up in here? Put that back up. Put that back up. Everybody, put that back up quick. Everybody who won't eat them is Whitley. Once you put the hot sauce on top, the smell is gone. And you can only put Texas Pete now. Only Texas Pete, Tabasco, Louisiana, all that other stuff don't work. Just need you some good old rice. Not too much of the water. And you can't eat everybody's, amen? Because if you eat the right ones, there ain't no smell, amen? If you put enough vinegar on there in that Texas Pete, it takes all the smell away and you're going to have a good... Thanksgiving, amen. Yes. Now I have to eat mine in the basement. And I have to use my own microwave. And I can't use the upstairs microwave. Let's see if I'm about to get in trouble up in here. But that is the great debate that occurred this week on Facebook. Who eats chitlins or not? I pray to God that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I pray to God that you had a wonderful meal. And I will admit that the, the Thanksgiving meal has gotten non-traditional for some folk. I've heard even this morning different things that people are eating. Not everybody eats turkey and ham and dressing and macaroni and cheese and collard greens and sweet potato pie. I've been seeing some of y'all want to do seafood on Thanksgiving and crab legs and till you do right by that Thanksgiving turkey. I tell you, until you do right by that turkey and dressing, everything you touch ain't going to taste right, amen? But I asked, we were at our cousin's house, and, and they're Cynthia's cousins by blood, but they're my cousins by spirit. And Cynthia has, I'm sorry, I can't talk about my wife, my roommate, has a, has a large, wonderful, loving family. Uh, my, uh, my mom is an only, only child, and uh, my dad um, has two sisters who don't live in town. So uh, Cynthia's family is my extended family, and um, they get together every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, and they are a huge family. And there's nothing like when you get to share Thanksgiving and Christmas, Lisa, with huge families, amen? Because so much is going on. Every room got something going on. The children got theirs going on. The spades table. Got <laughs> spades table got their going on. The men watching my cowboys beat them redskins. So, amen. And then you got a few who slip out in, even though it's 20 and 30 degrees, that slip out on the back porch or even outside to get a drag. <laughs> And a bud, amen? You're going to find everything at the black Thanksgiving dinner, amen? But as we were planning this week and as we were planning this meal and sat at that meal, I, I thought about one of the meals um, that I was pleasured to have while I was in the Holy Land. I was reminded about the third day that we were there in Nazareth of Galilee 
on the third day of our trip to Nazareth, the Galilee, we were able to go to the city of Nazareth and just keep going. And we had a meal there. There is a little city that they have created within the city. Keep going means next. <laughs> God bless you. And they've created this whole, they've created a city, a village in modern day Nazareth, but they have replicated the city to what it looked like when Jesus was alive. Uh, they had a real shepherd there with real sheep. Keep going. And we got to see this shepherd and his sheep and what a shepherd looks like. Pause. We got to see real women plucking real olives and see how olive oil is made. And I'll come back in the couple Sundays and tell you how olive oil is made. And they still use these non-modern presses to create olive oil. The same olive oil we would eat is the same olive oil was pressed and made into all during this visit next. We went and saw also a house, a house that would look like what Jesus lived in and how barren it was and how it didn't have the comforts and accoutrements that our homes had. Didn't see no big screen TV, no TV on the wall, no couches, just wood, cement, and everything that he sat on, his family had to make next. Then we were able to go into the synagogue or a replica of the synagogue upon which his family would have taken him to during his stay and time in Nazareth. And how beautiful it was next, how the accoutrements and the sound in there, and how I was able to pick up one of the scrolls there on the altar. And just as he picked up the scroll when they were to read from Isaiah next, it was a wonderful experience being there in Nazareth. And then we got to sit down for a meal, a traditional meal that he would have eaten while he was living in Nazareth. This meal consisted of three main things, or really four main things. Pita bread, a chicken leg quarter, salad, and lentil stew. A leg quarter that they could have kept. <laughs> Pita bread, salad, and lentil stew. And as I ate that lentil stew, I thought about this passage of scripture in Genesis chapter 25, verses 27 through 34. Genesis chapter 25, verses 27 through 34. Genesis chapter 25, verses 27 through 34. And the boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat out of, of his venison, which is deer meat. But Rebekah loved Jacob. This whole right there. And Isaac loved Jacob. I'm sorry, Esau. But he did eat of his venison because he did eat of his venison. But Rebecca loved Jacob. We got a problem right now. We got parents who got favorite children. We, we got a problem in the drama all right now. Even if you do have a favorite child, you don't let nobody know about it. Next. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau come, came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me. I pray thee with that same red pottage. For I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Esau said, Behold, what profit it me? I swear to me this day, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised 
his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau, same thing we had, bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I want to talk this Sunday after Thanksgiving from the subject when the stew ain't for you. When the stew ain't for you. When the stew ain't for you. My brothers and my sisters, the the Old Testament, Erica, as you know, and Ron, is a history book that is written backwards. Unlike the New Testament that is written in the present and in the future, the New Testament is much present as it is future because it's what we call eschatological, means it points to the future and the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, We can claim that the New Testament is written in the present because it's the same people who wrote the Gospels who actually got to walk with Jesus and hear the words of Jesus. But the Old Testament, Reverend Amersley, is different. It is written backwards. It is written based upon not only God's inspiration, but is based also upon oral traditions. For those of us who are African and African Americans, we understand oral traditions. It is most of our history was told by oral traditions. A lot of us don't have front porches anymore because you want to hide back in your backyard with your screened in or your wooden privacy fence. But there's some of you who, who grew up in the country and can remember the front porch conversations, and that's how you learned about your family through those front porch conversations and even the secrets of your family. When you didn't know your cousin was your cousin. <laughs> Ain't nobody won't say nothing. But, but they came from an oral tradition, but then somebody had the forethought to say, we need to write this stuff down. We need to write this history down of how the world was created and how God showed up in the life history of our people, the people of God, which are the Israelites' people initially. I I do, I I declare unto you, I've got to believe the whole Bible, will preach the whole Bible, but I I do have a problem when they call themselves the children of God or the children, the chosen people, because all of us, up in here, up in here are God's chosen people. Just as Israel's children are the chosen people, Big Mama's children, through all the hell we've been through, serving the same God, are the chosen people as well. And so what thing they had to do was they had to explain how the birthright and the promise went through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when it should have gone through Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau going to teach today, Pastor. Yes, I am. They had to explain in their writings, how did the birthright, how did the history of Israel and its people, how did they change their culture and their system of patriarchy and also their system of probate law where the oldest son, Erica, got everything and got all the inheritance and got all the power in the family. Whoever was the oldest child, even if a lady or girl or daughter was born first, whoever was the oldest son when the father died came in charge and received everything. And then by his hopeful benevolence, he would then give out to the rest of the children what he thought they deserved. That's why I'm nice to George. (laughs) Just in case they bring these laws back. And my older brother is in charge of everything. And so they have to explain, again, why doesn't it go Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau? How does it break? How does the chain break? How does it become Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when Jacob and when both Isaac and Jacob were younger than their older brothers? I, I thought people would talk to me on my day back. I, I just knew I was going to have somebody speak back to me. The, how does this happen? How do they break this cycle where it's the oldest boy that becomes in charge? How do the children of Israel come from the loins of Jacob and not from Esau? 
And because they were not there during the time period, they had to figure it out based upon some other facts how this thing had had happened. How does Jacob become the inheritor of his father's birthright? How does Jacob become the power source? How does Jacob then wrestle with that angel, change his name to Israel, then develop the 12 tribes of Israel who would then spend their lives in Egypt and then come back and take over the promised land? Why do we say in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and not in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? So they have to explain how this thing happened in history. And the story posits three different reasons, three different reasons why this thing happened. First of all, they suggest that, number one, there was a fight in the womb. Any Bible readers in here today? Uh, anybody been to Sunday school once or twice? All right, all you new people, let me explain to you. Rebecca says that she felt that they were fighting in the womb, and the fact was that when the twins came out, they're not identical, they're fraternal, but when the fraternal twins came out, Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel. And it suggested unto Rebecca that, that Jacob was trying to pull Esau back in so that he could come out first. Now, here's the problem with that on a practical level. Jacob is in the womb. He don't know that he needs to be number one. And I need to explain to somebody here right now who got an ego and got some arrogance about it, you ain't got to be number one either. When you come out, you just come out. And that's the baby boy. I'm going to tell you there's some advantages of being the baby boy. I wish I had my mama here today to be a witness. That's just some advantages of being the baby in the family. But the Bible says that she, 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 she felt him grabbing Esau, trying to pull him back in so that he might come out first and be the oldest son. And practically, I thought about that thing. How would she even know that? How does she know what's going on inside of her womb? How does she know? Ain't no ultrasound, ain't no x-rays, ain't no OBGYNs yet to let them know that the two sons are fighting in the womb. Oh, but before the CIA, before the FBI, before a law and order SUV, there's something called a woman's intuition. Help me some mother, help me some mother, help me some mother. That's why sometimes, that's why mothers and fathers deal differently when you have a, a miscarriage and a stillborn. Maybe that's why sometimes even families fall apart. That's why the woman can't deal with the woman has that pain because she's felt that child. She's been with that child. That child hasn't come out for the father to hold yet, but the mother knows everything. You know there's a problem with that baby before the doctor tells you. The baby ain't moving the way it used to move. The baby ain't kicking the way it used to kick. You ain't sick the way you used to be sick. You know there's a problem before the doctor diagnoses the problem with your child. So Rebecca knows there's something going on in her womb and there's a competition going on there. And that competition comes out naturally. When as they come out, most come out, you know, a little time. And praise God, you ain't got to wait 20 to 30 minutes to an hour for that second baby to come out. They come out together, holding one another. And that's how brothers and sisters need to be. Yeah. 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 Holding one another. I praise God for them little two little scrubs that live with me. <laughs> Best of friends. And it helps that they're two years apart. My brother and I are four years apart, and we weren't initially the best of friends because of our age difference and because of our personality difference. George is quiet and shy and, and to himself, and when we would go out of town, we would always stop by the sick, go to get gas on Fair Road. He would get a comic book. I'd get a Snickers. <laughs> some things change. Some things remain the same. <laughs> he didn't want to go outside and play. He just wanted to sit inside and watch cartoons. I wanted to go outside and play football on the street, not in the grass, but on the street. Let's tackle on the street. We're just, 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 just different, and you can have difference in your children, and your children can be different, but there's got to be a time when you and your brother and sister, before mom and daddy die, come together. Yeah. 
Because ain't nothing worse than dealing with families that don't like each other at a funeral. And then they put the funeral director in the middle of it. Sometimes, y'all, I be in funeral arrangement conference like I'm watching Venus and Serena. Just watching they argue with one another and argue with one another and going crazy over money. And who going to get this and who going to get what? And they be dividing your stuff even before you get in the ground. Ain't nobody want to be real up in here. That's fine. I'll talk about your family even if you won't. So first thing they posit is that there was a fight in the womb that split them apart. And that's how the birthright thing changed. But I like this because it, it, it teaches us something else. That you've you got to also be very careful about marrying outside of the covenant. You got to be very careful about marrying outside of the covenant. Esau marries two Canaanite women. The children of Israel were not allowed to marry outside of their quote unquote religion and race. If you were Jewish, you had to marry a Jewish woman. And I still think in some of their sects, it still works that way now. Um, even in the Trump family, um, Ivanka had to convert to Judaism because her husband was Jewish. And they couldn't have a Jewish wedding without her also being Jewish. And so they're real serious about that thing. Uh, us just bring anybody we want to. <laughs> to the altar. But I tell everybody I'm blessed to minister to, don't ever bring nobody to this altar to alter them. Don't bring nobody to the A-L-T-A-R, the A-L-T-E-R them. What you got before going to be worse after you bring them to this altar. Now, if you did it right, you weren't living together. So you saw them when you saw them. You talked to them when you talked to them. If you didn't want to talk to them no more, you hit the red button. But when you're married, you wake up with a mess. You eat with a mess. You go to bed with a mess. You wake up to a headache. And that's why you never mar marry somebody where you're not equally yoked with. And so he was not equally yoked with the Canaanites' women, and the parents got upset. And that needs to be another sign to y'all. When your mama ain't happy with who you marrying. I know I'm going to do what I want to do. She'll come around. It's my life. We paying for the wedding. We don't need your money. We don't care if you show up or not. I promise you what she is. And you're going to have problem every day, every month, every year after that. I had, and then, then, I'm glad things have changed, but let me just be real with you. We've come a long way. Uh, but I have a close friend who married outside of his race, and uh, she was outside the race. And her parents ain't come to the wedding. Normally, traditionally, it's the wife's family who pays um, for the wedding. Man, glad I only got one daughter. Um, and they didn't come, so he had to pay. My friend had to pay for the wedding. And her parents ain't come. They didn't want nothing to do with it. And they caused havoc in their relationship throughout the brief duration of that marriage. And now they're divorced. Now, Pastor, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. You can't really use that as in the good example. But I can use it as a good example of that when your mama ain't happy with y'all's decision, you're going to have pain even before the divorce. I, I, I know I'm telling the truth. And so one of the things they're suggesting here in the text is because he married outside of the covenant, and that's the covenant with God, that that's why he lost his birthright. And third and finally, the text suggests that he lost his birthright because he sold it out for a cup of stew. The Bible says that he sold it out for a cup of stew. Esau was Isaac's favorite because he was a hard worker. He was the firstborn. Jacob understood the hierarchy. And his son was always hunting and always bringing food for the family. They called him Edom because of his red skin. 
And if you know the entire story, even though Rebecca liked Jacob and Isaac had favor with Esau, Rebecca understood that the birthright actually came through the father and not through the son. That the sons could not decide on their own who got the birthright. That's why Jacob is the trickster, because he tricked Esau in selling him something that he did not own. I wish I could preach up in here today. He sold him something, and he purchased something that was stolen goods. And if you buy something that are stolen goods, both you, the buyer, and you, the seller, if found out, both go into jail. And the sad reality is that a whole lot of people have sold themselves out and sold their souls for stew. Too many people, maybe I'm just preaching to the good folk and to the choir, but there's so many people who have sold themselves out just so you can say you got a man. I'm fine, God. I'm with you. Me and you. Just me and you. Ain't nobody want to be a witness up in here after Thanksgiving because they're family around. I know. They don't want to tell the truth. They ain't going to clap. They're going to look straight at the wall, but even though they know they have done it. But they ain't going to be a witness for you today, but I'm going to be a witness just for you, me and you, God, right here together. Close your eyes so you can't even see them lying. <laughs> Sow yourself out for a $75 TV at Walmart that don't even get a good picture. Sow yourself out to some man selling meat out of his truck. What you doing buying meat out of somebody pickup truck on the side of the road? Selling yourself out for that sofa that that man said he had a few extra and the people didn't. Ain't nobody want to say nothing. Ain't nobody want to be real up in here. Selling yourself out that stuff that don't belong to you. But let me tell you what I like about this thing told y'all before that things should have really gone through Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau. Oh yeah, that's how the birthright should have gone based upon laws and customs that it should have gone through, 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 through Abraham. And then the older child was Ishmael, and then the older child was Esau. And you notice that back in this culture that it went through the oldest son. But, but what I like about this story, Eric, and what the text is really teaching us before I go on to the next thing is that, uh, especially because of Jesus, that thing got flipped all the way. That it don't matter your position or your gender. Ain't nobody want to say nothing. That because of Jesus, it don't matter your position or your gender. Henry VIII had wives killed and divorced just so he could have a male heir to the throne of England. But you see who's been sitting on the throne forever, and she ain't dying. Charles ain't never going to be king. <laughs> Elizabeth going to bury Charles. And watch our homegirl from Los Angeles going to be the queen one day. <laughs> See, Jesus came and flipped the script on them and said, it don't matter your position or your gender. The birthright and the promises of God belong to all of us if you believe. Everybody gets what's coming to you. For what God has for me, it is for me. And I'm thankful today after Thanksgiving. I was thankful before Thanksgiving that everything God has for me, it is for me. And I'm going to be grateful for it. Well, let me tell you a true story. True story. Last week, Fred Garrett the owner of Watkins Garrett and Woods Mortuary in Greenville, South Carolina, went on to be with the Lord. And I think Mr. Garrett was either 92 or 93 years old. And he, like my grandmother, died. My grandmother, who was the president of our funeral home, died when she was 95 and worked all the way up to 93. Undertakers, they die, but they die late. <laughs> well, his son... His son, his son Doug is, besides Brian Myers, my closest friend in the funeral business. Doug and I are close because the fact that not only are we in the funeral business together, but we 
we have similar daddies, good daddies, but controlling daddies, who remind you all the time you don't own nothing around here. <laughs> now, I got a great daddy now. And you, when you see him, tell him I said he a good daddy. And my dad is a good daddy. My daddy don't know how much I make and see he, till he sees the W-2 at the end of the year. That's a good daddy. But he going to remind you that that's still his money. <laughs> and so as we were driving to Greenville, Ron, and talking about Mr. Garrett and what a great man he was, and this man brought undertakers all the way from California. All across the country, our colleagues showed up to show their support for Mr. Garrett, Doug, and his family. And then any time me and my daddy get together, because he's not at the funeral home every day, there's going to be one question every time. How much money in the bank? Every time we get together alone, every time, it, it, with, without pausing, we're just going to get something to eat. How much money in the bank? Well, thank God for apps. I can clearly go to the app. And I done taught the old man, Cliff, how to go to the app. I done gave him all the passwords and all the codes, but he still got to ask me how much money in the bank. And even whatever amount I tell him, Cliff, is always the same refrain. That's all. <laughs> I said, well, Daddy, since we're talking about accounts and banking, when you going to tell me where the, all the other accounts are? <laughs> we going to Mr. Garrett's funeral. He controlled his funeral home, and Doug didn't start signing checks maybe to two years ago. Oh, black owners of business, they keep everything to themselves. It's just, I think they keep all their money right there in their left pocket, too. Y'all know them old black men that cash their whole check now? Ain't nobody won't say nothing. That's you, because that's you. You cash your whole check and keep it right there in your pocket. You don't trust no bank. And so I said, Daddy, you know, since we're talking about dead undertakers, <laughs> it's about time you tell George and I where everything's at. Because I don't want to be crying and happy at the same time. Say, ain't nobody want to be real <laughs> when you die. And also, Daddy, I don't want to be stuck like a lot of people who don't know where their parents' affairs are. And if you've ever been in that situation where your parents were so secretive, and when they die, you don't know where the life insurance is, you don't know how to cut off the phone bill, you don't know how to cut off the lights, you don't know how to none of it, because some people are very secretive. It's almost like that if they tell you what's coming to you, you're going to try to get it too early. Right. <laughs> and there's no trust in some families. So I said, Daddy, and because me and my brother are equal, neither, we ain't greedy, we, don't, you know, we, we, we get along. I told you we get along, and so I just said, Dad, it's just about time you tell George and I where everything's at so we know if anything would to ever happen to you. And my dad replied, don't you worry. The executor of my estate knows where everything is. I said, well, Daddy, who is the executor? None of your business. I said, Daddy, I know you got some stuff hidden somewhere. I, I know, Daddy, you've been working hard all your life. You've been a blessing to us. I know there's a whole lot of stuff out there, and I don't want to go be searching for it. I, so just go ahead and tell George and I, it ain't for me. I'm good. That's why I got two other jobs, just in case my name ain't in the wheel, Daddy. But you need to go and tell us where everything is so we know what happens, if anything, because tomorrow ain't promised to none of us, y'all. Don't you worry, son. The executive knows. I said, Daddy! Before I push you out this car on 26, who is the executor? And he used a non-gender profile when he said they know. So I don't know if that's mama or my brother.
And he said, don't you worry. Everything going to be all right. And then he says, as a matter of fact, son, you ain't really got to worry about nothing. Because if I leave you anything in my will, it's because I didn't know I had it. And a little tear <laughs> came to my eye. But I want to thank God even if that's the case. I've got another daddy. Yeah. And I want to let somebody know your last name might not be Levi. That might not be a business to leave to you. But you've got another daddy. Yeah. And let me tell you how you get access to everything God's got for you in your inheritance. See, I told you this text is, is more about stew, and that's why I titled it The Stew Ain't For You. It's more about stew. It's how God had flipped that thing, and where the people tried to make it go through the oldest son, God is saying my inheritance goes through everybody who believes. <laughs> There's a story that my cousin, Dr. Joe Albert Bush, told about three weeks ago at the funeral of Barbara Moore. And I told Dr. Bush I like that story. Matter of fact, I'm going to microwave that story. And the first time I tell the story, I'm going to give you credit for the story. But the second time, it's mine and the Lord's. <laughs> and he told this story about this rich man who died. And he died a widower, Ron. He died without his wife, and then his son died as well. He died by himself. And he was like Lot, the richest man in the city. And this man owned homes not only in Paris, not only in London, but owned homes in Miami. He, he had a Bentley and a Rolls Royce. He had all his wife's jewelry. He had about a million dollars worth of paintings. And because he had no heirs to leave it to, he told his lawyer that when I die, I want you to auction everything off, and we're going to give it to charity. And so everybody in the town knew this man. They knew how rich he was. They were put up broadsides. They put it in the paper. They put it on the Internet that we're going to auction off all the old man's stuff. Anybody who comes can bid on the stuff that the old man has to give, all of his homes, all of his real estate, all of his cars, all of his jewelry, all of his paintings, he even got a Picasso in here. But you got to come to the auction on this day and this time. And all these people came to this coliseum because everybody was there because they knew how much this man had. And they had this auction, Erica, in this large coliseum. And the auctioneer gay came up and he says, I've got this picture of the man's son. And the will says that the first thing we're going to bid on is a picture of the man's son. And we want to start the bidding off at $40. Will anybody buy this picture of the man's son for forty dollars. Ain't nobody said a word. He said, Well, we're gonna try to sell it for thirty-nine dollars. Will anybody take the picture of the man's son for thirty-nine dollars? Ain't nobody said a word. Well, maybe we could get thirty-eight dollars just of the picture of the man's son whom he loved. Ain't nobody would buy the man's picture. Or well, we're gonna try thirty-seven dollars. Will anybody buy it for thirty-seven dollars and nobody? said a word. 36? Nobody said a word. 34? Nobody said a word. 33? One man raised his paddle. See, we got to bid for $33 for the man's picture. Can we get 34? Nobody said a word. Can we get 34? Anybody will take it for 34? Nobody said a word. Well, Going once, going twice, three times, sold to the man for $33. And then the auctioneer said, the auction is now closed. We're done. You can go home. Wait a minute! What about the Bentley? We're done. Wait a minute! What about the Rolls Royce? We're done. What about the house in Paris? That's the one I wanted. Sorry, the will says we're done. What about the homes in Miami? Sorry, the will says we're done. What about his wife's jewelry? Sorry, nothing I can do. It's right here in writing. We're done. What about that Picasso? I had cleared a wall for it. I'm sorry, but the will says whoever takes the sun 
gets it all. And I want to let somebody know that if you want everything God has got for you, you got to take the sun. I heard the Bible says that no man can come to the Father but by his son. And you can get the sun right now. Anybody want to bid on the sun right now? Anybody want to take Jesus right now? Anyone want to take a picture of my Savior? Going once, going twice, going three times. Can I hear you say Jesus? Can I hear you say Jesus? Can I hear you say Jesus? If you take him, you'll get it all. Say it! Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Be grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful. That is what Thanksgiving is all about. Being grateful. On that first Thanksgiving, those English settlers were thankful for the fact that those Native Americans taught them how to grow corn, taught them and showed them how to produce. Isn't it interesting that the natives were kind to the immigrants? <laughs> Ain't it funny how we done changed what this country is all about based upon one fool in the crazy house. It ain't the White House. It's the crazy house. We celebrate Thanksgiving because the natives were nice to the immigrants. But not now. We send guns and tanks to make sure no immigrants come in. But Thanksgiving is all about a group of people saying, here, we know you're new to the land, and you ain't got nothing to eat, and we have no ulterior motive. We're not even asking you to sell your birthright. We just want to have a meal together because we're all God's children. And I invite somebody today and pray that after hearing this word, you know that you are an inheritor to the promise. No matter your position, no matter your gender, no matter where you come from, no matter what your economic position is right now. Anybody believe that God's got more and he's got more in store for those who are obedient to his son? If you take the son, you get it all. We offer Christ to someone today. We want to give you Jesus. We, we want you to have a picture of this son in your heart and in your mind. For the text tells us that no man comes unto the Father but by the Son. And if you want to see him and you want to inherit heaven, you've got to take him, son. Come on, Aaron. Is there one today? Some folk would rather have houses and land. Some folk choose silver and gold. Ooh, oh. But these things they treasure yeah. and forget about their soul. I decided to make Jesus make him my choice. Oh, you know the road. The going gets tough, and the hills are hard to climb. I started out. Why don't you start today? A long time Come on, ago. Come on, give your life to Christ. 
There is no doubt in my mind. I've decided to make Jesus my choice. church home. We want to be your home away from home. Come on to Jesus. Some folk would rather have houses and land. They choose silver and gold. Ooh, but these things, so many treasures, and forget about their soul. I decided to make Jesus. Hallelujah. You know the road is rough. Sometimes the going gets tough and the hills are hard to climb. Stop debating God. I started out. Step on the road and take a And God has promised to give you everything in my mind. Everything in my mind. Decided to make Jesus stretch out across the aisle. My choice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you, Lord. God, our Father, we come today not because it's Thanksgiving season we do come to give thanks we come to thank you God for life we come to thank you God for health and we've come to thank you God for our strength God we want to thank you God that we're able to see our relatives this week that they had safe travels here and to God we thank you God that on this day we were able to bring this beautiful baby girl Ryan back unto you God to say thank you for giving her to her family God we come today, God, thanking you for this word of us understanding that all good and perfect things and all of our inheritance and all the promises of God come from you. It's not about our birthright or the way we came in, whether we're the youngest or the oldest, whether we're male or female, God. You've got something for us, God. And we stand here as a grateful people, thanking for every material thing you've given us, but also, God, thank you for what we don't know that you've given us through a sound body, for a sound mind, God, for the tumor that was growing, ain't growing no more, for the cancer that was destroying, but ain't destroying no more, God. Thank you for the craziness that you have already regulated in our mind, God. Thank you for the blood pressure that's no longer hurting us. Thank you for the diabetes that's no longer controlling us, God. We want to thank you for things we do not see, God. It's so easy, God, to thank you for our children. So easy, God, to thank you for our jobs. It's so easy, God, to thank you for our houses and land. So easy, God, to thank you for our cars and jewelry, God. But we come to thank you, God, for things you're doing behind the scenes, God, because we know that the Holy Spirit is making hundreds on our behalf that we don't understand, God. And somebody wants to say thank you, God. There was a wreck supposed to happen, but it did not happen, God. I was supposed to be fired, but I didn't get fired, God. I was supposed to be dead, but I'm still alive. Anybody want to say thank you, God, uh, for giving me my life, God. Thank you, God, for giving me my family, God. Thank you, God, that you allowed a meal on Thursday, God. Thank you! Even if the road has been tough. Yes, sir. Even if they're going. Even if they're here. As the songwriter says, some time ago, I promised to give my life to you, God, and I took your son. And after my decision to take him, you've given me everything that I've needed, God. So bless your people right now, God. Give them what they stand in need of, God. Whatever's going on in their life, you know, God. And we stand in covenant relationship with them right now, God. Interceding on their behalf, God. No matter what their struggle is, God. No matter what the vicissitudes of life they're going through right now, God. You are a healer. You are a deliverer, God. And once we come through, we'll be so careful to give your name the glory and the honor. 
that which is worth. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, may it rest, ruin, and abide with each one of you now henceforth and forevermore. And just say amen. 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 Give somebody a hug as we go out. Anybody decided? Yeah.